Good morning and welcome back to another episode of Kandatula So Pat Safari. I almost said solo, I get so confused all the time. Um, it is an earlier start than I promised Britty would have. It is a little chilly this morning again, but the reason we've left early and the reason I've ignored lions roaring by the camp and uh, leopard tracks going towards Mashati Dam because there was a report of some wild dogs uh, coming into our concession yesterday evening. So we are going to be heading into that area. Hopefully we can have some luck and uh, come along for the ride. Let's see what the morning has to bring. Rather fat-bellied hyena is uh, on the prowl. A lot of hyena tracks have managed to so far pick up one track of a wild dog, but uh, we haven't got a, a trail to follow on yet. Uh, hoping that this hyena gives us a little bit more of a clue as to where these dogs might be. Is a bulging belly. How I feel this morning. Quite an aged hyena. Um, not always the easiest to tell how old they are, but I've spoken about giraffes getting darker as they get older and hyenas are almost the opposite. They uh, get lighter as they get older and as she's turned around now since she's not as light as I thought she was. <laughs> but uh, they start out black and uh, when they're young they've got very clear, very distinctive spots. They tend to become a much lighter brown as they get older. So probably a middle to late aged hyena who's going to be having a poop behind the bush. Mm, that hyena was showing about as much excitement as I do for knitting. Um, sorry, rutting in parlours. We're going to carry on looking for these dogs. Um, if we don't get anything in the next half hour, then we just gotta carry on with drive as normal. But I must say, one nice thing about not having uh, real passengers in the back is I haven't had to explain why we haven't seen anything for the last hour. I can just edit that entire hour out of our sofa safari clip. But stick around, it is going to be a good morning. I can feel it once I wake up. Okay, let's do this. Guess what, it's still not wild dogs, given up on those buggers. Uh, we do, however, have a beautiful male battaleur who was perched in incredible light and decided that he wanted uh, not to be on camera. So it's flown slightly silhouetted image, but uh, I think you still get the idea. You can probably just about see his beautiful red face and red legs there. The... Um, Latin name or scientific name for them um, actually means the beautiful face with no tail. So, Terathopius equidata, I think it is. I'd have to double check that. He's about to be mobbed by a fork tailed drongo. He lost interest very quickly. <laughs> this boy is very camera shy, which is a little sad because they are, without doubt, our most strikingly beautiful evil. Um, and nice to see them perched. Uh, so often we see them gliding around and their characteristic upturned wingtips, but um, we don't see them perched because they do just spend so much of their day circling around on the thermals looking to scavenge things off the ground. They will hunt too, but uh, probably about six or seven hours a day are spent flying around. But this male here is waiting for exactly that, for it to warm up a little bit, for these thermals to be created, and then it's uh, far less energy intensive flying around, just gliding from thermal to thermal, as opposed to flapping about. But um, he's not interested in uh, sitting around for us, so we're going to carry on. All right. Um... Luke did a few tracks on his last episode of Sofa Safari and uh, just coming down this road which clearly hasn't been used for a while because you can barely see a tire tread mark there has been a lot of animal activity but the one that caught my eye were these tracks over here one two three um almost looks as if someone just put their three fingers in the ground but these are tracks that belong to an art fark one of our nocturnal creatures that a lot of 
um, long time safari goers want to see. It's kind of the um, pinnacle of your game viewing if you can get to see an eye fox, especially out in this part of the world. You can go to the places like the Kalahari where they are a lot more active in the day during the winter and you have a chance of seeing them. But out here they're very, very nocturnal, normally only leaving their burrows around an hour or so after sunset and back in their burrows before sunrise uh, so unless you're driving around at night you're probably not going to see them um he's come along the road here this is probably actually a better example you can see the three toes and then in the front here you can actually see where the the big claws of the the art park have penetrated into the sand those are the claws that are going to be able to dig through the cement like termite mounds to get into there to eat the ants um, there's also tracks for a leopard uh, over here that have walked around same thing with the four toes three four and then the three lobes on the back pad and not very fresh the birds have walked on top of that the art park even walked on top of the leopard so um yeah this is from last night sometime good to know they're around who knows maybe if we're lucky and actually do a night drive an art park will pop onto your screen but uh i've been here over 13 years and i've seen two so uh, i wouldn't uh hedge my bets on that one but that's it art park so we've just come across these two impala rams seemingly sizing one another up. It's a good little patch of land. So we're just going to sit with him because I think that this fight could take place. we get a little bit more serious. But at the moment, it's a lot of posturing, sizing one another up. You'll see them kind of yawning and sticking their tongues out, stretching their necks out. Um, all just a way of trying to show your opponent how big you are and hope that he realizes he's not quite as big as you and that you are the stronger individual and will back down because I don't really want to fight. If they can do anything to actually avoid physical contact, they will. Um, you need little displays help with that. If neither party decides to back down, uh, then a fight will ensue and that can be quite something to witness. Haven't seen any proper fights this year, all just these kind of testing encounters but uh, let's see what happens and the reason that they're not very inclined to engage in a physical fight is because there's risks involved um, they do risk injury uh, surprisingly few impalas actually die as a result of these fights probably only about one percent of uh, nat natural deaths are as a result of fighting and uh, the males actually have a thickened dermal shield a thickened skin around the neck the back and the head which you don't find in the female so the assumption is that this has evolved to try and protect them in the fight but when they're going at each other I mean they are trying to impale the imp opponent with their horns so if you can risk uh, avoid that risk and win a fight without actually coming to blows all the better for you. You don't waste energy, you don't risk injury, and you still achieve the result you want. Alarm calling, trying to uh, unnerve the opponent as well. Um, if I were a betting man, I would definitely have my money on the guy on the right. Um, he's managed to push the impala on the left all the way to the left, over about 70-80 meters. Moving now into a bit of a thicket area, um, this clashing of horns is often like ringing the dinner bell for predators and hoping like mad that there's a leopard that's heard this and is coming and sitting and waiting and they would be sitting on the outskirts of these open areas in these thickets. So it's a dangerous time for these male impalas and Fingers crossed that Tumbela is here. 
Right. Just looking at this group of terrapins sitting on a log here at Mishatam Dam, um, and that makes me realize I don't actually know the collective noun for group of terrapins. So I've been slacking and asking you questions. You can save me doing some research. So if anybody can tell me what a group of terrapins is called, that would be great. Uh, but this has made me think of a message that we got from Vicky Eldo, um, who is a teacher at uh, De La Salle Holy Cross College uh, in Victory Park in Johannesburg. And she's busy teaching her class about uh, hibernation and migration of animals and was wondering whether we have any animals that hibernate here at Tundatula. Now, hibernation, as I'm sure her class is well aware, that is when uh, animals go into a state of dormancy and basically sleep through very cold periods, not so much to get away from the cold, but to get away from the lack of food. Uh, in areas like this where although our winter times do get cold, it never gets that cold. Um, but we do tend to have drier conditions, so animals in this area would be more likely to do something called estivation, which is uh, the same kind of thing, staying dormant and sleeping through periods of dryness that also don't have enough food for you. But um, being a subtropical area, our, even our dry winter months tend to have enough food to keep these animals active. Um, so we don't have any mammals that truly hibernate like your polar bears would or your bears in North America would. Uh, but we do have many reptiles that do go through these states of dormancy during the colder times of the year where food is um, less available and as what cold-blooded it's a very terrible word for these animals because their blood is not cold they just are more correctly called ectothermic animals they cannot generate their own body heat um, so during the winter times where it is a bit more difficult to generate your body heat um, and get your body temperature up they will go through these periods of dormancy where they spend uh, maybe just parts of the day or the evenings and, and wake up uh, for a few hours every day to go be active uh, but it's not true hibernation it's, it's called uh, in for reptiles it's called a state of torpor or um, brunation uh, is the the other term that we use so it's not really hibernation and i hope i haven't confused the kids uh, but uh, the simple answer is no we don't have animals that truly hibernate just some reptiles that do go through periods where they are resting things like your um, African rock pythons they might find a big termite mound go and spend uh, a, a few months just uh, resting up in there your monitor lizards will often find holes in trees I've in the past found them where they've picked a branch of a tree and they go and they sleep on that same branch for literally months on end don't move but if a good warm day does suddenly come up they might go be active for a while and then return to their branch we drive past one day and they've suddenly turned around. So they're not completely out of it, but they do. Our reptiles do definitely go through these uh, reduced periods of dormancy. So, sorry, reduced periods of activity and higher dormancy. So I hope that helps answer that question. And Vicky, also just a shout out to your girls, Kelsey and Amy, who I believe are big fans of the show and check for new episodes every day. So I hope they do enjoy this one. But uh, I think that's enough of turtles. Not turtles, terrapins. Terrible guarding there. We're going to go around and see if we can catch up with those buffaloes. Just discussing with Brittany now whether we've actually filmed herds of buffalo on our sofa safaris because they, although they have been around, often not in the days that we've done our recording. And um, I've only shown Dugger boys, so it's nice to come across one of these breeding herds. They're quite spread out at the moment, so we're not getting a full effect of just how big the group is. Saw them yesterday at Mashat and Dammons, probably about a hundred or so of them here. Um, some of them are still grazing, some still milling around close to the dam having a drink. Uh, there's quite a few on the other side that are now emerging from the river banks. Um, probably going to come and settle here for the day. I mean, we're pushing on in the morning. Um, they've probably been feeding for a couple of hours already and spending time on the green banks of the Mashat and Riverbed in the uh, shaded areas there you get some very good grass growing including something called buffalo grass that they, they do thoroughly enjoy. Many of the other grazers uh, we have mentioned before don't make best use of it because of the dangers of feeding in the very thick areas but when you are a hundred of you each weighing females 400-500 kilograms, males 700-800 kilograms there's a little bit more of a safety aspect so they're able to make use of that greenery on the riverbank but now during the heat of the day, oh sorry, during the, yeah, I guess heat of the day, uh, they're going to be coming and lying up and ruminating 
but I'm going to contradict myself now by saying they're going to come and lie out in the open. It's still, even at yeah, nine o'clock in the morning now, we are, um, we are feeling that the temperature is uh, not as it should be. Uh, so they could probably spend a bit of time in the sun, warm up, and then heat of the day, they'll head towards the thickets. The buffaloes are closing in on us from both sides. They're generally very curious animals. Um, you can see both parts of the herd on either side are all just fixated on us. Um, buffaloes might not look like the smartest or most intelligent animals, um, the way they stare blankly at you for hours. But researchers have found that uh, they actually have quite a interesting and in a way complicated um, social decision-making system. In a group like this, call it a hundred individuals, although I actually suspect there may be a few more here, there's not one individual leader like you'd get in a elephant herd. Um, and it's not entirely one family. So you have these groups of related females with their attendant males, um, and collectively all these different groups of females come together and make up these large amalgamations in these breeding herds. Very curious cow coming up to us now. Um, but there's not one leader that makes the decision. Instead they've got what you call pathfinders. Now in all of my observations of buffaloes, I've never really noticed pathfinders standing out, but I haven't really been looking. But researchers that have, have found that um, when a herd is waking up to go and feed in the afternoon or in the morning, uh, they'll all be lying around in their clusters of related individuals, uh, ruminating, but when it's time to get up, about half an hour or 45 minutes before, there'll be a select group of females that will uh, stand up, reposition, lie down again. And rather than having their head low and chewing the cud or head held high to be alert, there's kind of an intermediate pose that they adopt. And what the researcher did was he noticed that this happened all the time and he orientated their bodies and um, where they were repositioned to lie down and face and realized that they all pointed to different feeding pastures, potential feeding pastures. But what he noticed was that the direction that the group would follow would be where the majority of these individuals had opted to face towards uh, and deduced that this was kind of a voting system, a democratic system where uh, they got their say and were the majority ruled and wherever these pathfinders wanted to go that was where the herd moved to. Um, I watch them, I don't see that much intelligence and that much decision making going on, but it is probably just because I'm not paying uh, close enough attention to them. But uh, yeah, they may be smarter than they look. They haven't necessarily got a set breeding season, though most of the mating and the birds do tend to take place in the summer, particularly late summer. Uh, in this area I've noticed kind of April, May, March, April, May tend to be the peak birth seasons. But it's everything that used to be typical about buffaloes when I started here got completely wiped away with the drought. I mean, even buffaloes themselves got largely wiped away during the drought. So it's it's good to see them coming back here. She's decided she doesn't like that group. She wants to be with that group. So this would not be a safer safari if it wasn't paying a visit to our uh, River Pride Cubs. And uh, we were fortunate enough that they were in camp first thing this morning. They've wandered a little bit down the road past our bush breakfast and have settled for the day. Um, the three younger cubs are now in that curious stage and it was oh, a little over a week ago they were the shy and um, secretive ones. They were the ones that were first to get up and come and investigate us this afternoon. I haven't seen a great deal of them over the last few days so uh, yeah, their confidence has grown day by day. And, uh, they're now satisfied. We can't be eaten, so they're going to go back in the shade. They may also be hot in the sun. And uh, there's milk on offer. That's also going to uh, always win out over staring at a car. We have a lilac breasted roller sitting beautifully in the sunlight here, and he or she is no doubt going to fly away the second I turn to talk to the camera. That reverse psychology didn't work. She's out relatively early in the afternoon. Looking at half past four, still about 40, 45 minutes of those teeth. Jaws well designed for crushing through bone. Very, very powerful. I mean, that big skull of theirs between the eye and the ear is all just for the attachment of those jaw muscles that 
allow them to crunch through parts of carcasses that even the lions aren't able to get to. But um, yeah, so early in the afternoon for this one to be walking around, potentially on the prowl, may have been alerted by some alarm calling in parlors. A lot of leopard activity in this area this morning, so possibly even just on the prowl to see if those leopards are up to anything. She'll stop, she'll listen, she'll smell very, very well tuned to her environment. It's only taken me like another 23 episodes of doing sofa safari to find something with spots, but here we go. So our hyena was uh, a little more well attuned to the environment than I was. Um, fortunately I caught a glimpse of a very odd looking branch hanging down from a tree, which on closer inspection was an impala leg. And when we came towards the tree, uh, we have got Mr. Shadulu. A uh, debutante, another debutante on a uh, sofa safari. It's one of the young males I actually haven't seen for sure, probably mid February was the last time I've seen him, so three months um, since uh, he was last around. And um, I've actually found a, not found, saw a skittish male yesterday, also at the kill in the same area. And I was very disappointed to see this big male here because I thought he's probably would have put pressure on a young male like this and chased him away. But obviously not. Uh, goodness knows where Shadulu has been hanging around, but uh, good to have him here. I'm just going to try reposition so if you can get a better view of him. You can see his young age from those nice, sharp, full complement of uh, white teeth. As they get older, much like lions, they tend, to, they tend to break them. They tend to get a bit yellow as they, as they uh, age too. Pregnant. <laughs> so I'm just going to go up to the tree in case he jumps up. Something's got his attention, some scent there that he's busy sniffing around at. You know, with the number of females in this area, Tumbela can venture up to here, near Leti, Nweti. It's also very likely that he has stolen this kill from them. Our hyena is back, uh, scavenging, waiting patiently just under the tree. And as the leopard has been feeding now, we can see that this kill is yet again a male impala, fully grown male impala, no doubt another victim of the rut. Um, and that's very, very characteristic of leopard hunting at this time of year when the males are so um, focused on other things and survival is quite low down the list. But 
in general, um, leopards do actually favour preying upon male impalas over females, actually more predators. There is a about a 60 to 40 percent ratio of male to female kills in, in amongst predators and most of the antelopes that they take. Um, but it actually tends to be younger male impalas that are preyed upon more frequently than these mature males. And it's because the young males get kicked out of the uh, dominant males' territories and live in uh, less ideal environments that are often quite thick and conducive to, to the hunting techniques of successful leopards. So using the thickets to ambush these young males as they're wandering through, whereas the females have the choice of the more open areas where it is safer, and dominant males tend to also have their territories in those areas. But uh, during this time of year when the males are running around chasing each other, fighting, chasing females, there are always going to be casualties like this. We're going to be leaving this male leopard enjoying what is left of his impala. Um, sadly not a great deal left, so he's going to be gone by the morning. But let's hope that uh, he stays around for all the foreseeable future. He's been a bit of an enigma. He comes, we see him regularly, then he disappears for a few months. Uh, so hopefully this is the start of his return. Um, but we'll keep a lookout in this area over the coming days and weeks and uh, hopefully catch up with him again soon. But uh, we're going to start making our way back to camp, uh, see what we find on the way back. But I hope you've enjoyed Chad finding a leopard for the first time in a very long time. It wasn't quite how my afternoon was planned. Uh, we were meant to come back and spend time with the lion cubs, but uh, a leopard got in the way. So I don't think anybody's complaining about that. But we're going to be calling it uh, a day for this episode of Tundatula Sofa Safari. So I hope you have enjoyed and please be sure to check up again very, very soon for the next episode. Until then, as always, stay safe. Cheers.